Welcome to Vegan Business Talk with Katrina Fox, author of Vegan Ventures, Start and Grow an Ethical Business. Hello and welcome to episode 54 of Vegan Business Talk. I'm Katrina Fox, journalist, author, media and PR coach, copywriter, editor and proofreader and founder of Vegan Business Media, a content, events and training platform providing success tips for vegan business owners and entrepreneurs. In this episode, I interview Tracy McQuirter, a public health nutritionist and plant-based educator in Washington, D.C. Tracy is a real trailblazer. A vegan of 30 years, she co-created the first vegan website by and for African Americans nearly 20 years ago with her sister, historian Maria McQuirter. She directed the country's first federally funded and community-based vegan nutrition program, the Vegetarian Society of D.C.'s Eat Smart program, launched with funding from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The course taught low-income D.C. residents about the health benefits of plant-based foods and how to shop for and prepare healthy vegan meals. And it was so popular that it became a national model. Tracy, who has a master's degree in public health nutrition and is a popular international speaker, is the best-selling author of By Any Greens Necessary, a revolutionary guide for black women who want to eat great, get healthy, lose weight and look fat. And that's spelled P-H-A-T. What a fantastic title. (laughs) And she's been featured in more than 150 media outlets, including Fox News, CBS News, The Washington Post and US. USA Today. In September 2016, Tracy released the first African American vegan starter guide in partnership with Farm Sanctuary. This is a free digital ebook containing 40 pages of information and inspiration from African American vegan experts on how to transition to a plant based diet, along with vegan recipes from renowned black vegan chefs. As well as consulting with organisations, Tracy offers one-to-one nutritional counselling appointments and online programmes in plant-based eating. In this interview, Tracy discusses the importance of having multiple streams of income, particularly if you're a service provider, how zoning in on a highly niche market helps you to grow your business, How hiring a publicist independently of her publishing house helped her gain national bestseller status for her book within six months of its release. The business benefits of collaborating with a non-profit on a project. The need for mentors and a community, especially at the beginning of your business. And much more. Here's the interview with Tracy McQuirter. Hello, Tracy. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm so happy to speak with you today. Thank you. It's great to be here. <laughs> so look, the very first question I ask everyone is particularly you know, those of us who are running mission driven businesses. What are your drivers for doing what you do? What's your why? My why is basically that I want to help people live um, longer, healthier, happier lives, freer lives. Um, and veganism is a wonderful way for me to do that. Fantastic. Okay, that's great. So you're coming from a, a sort of a, a health perspective. Is that right? Yes, I am. I started, um, my entry into veganism was through health um, 30 years ago, definitely. And about 10 years in, I became a vegan for for ethical reasons. So um, for the past 20 years, I've been 100% all the way vegan. That's wonderful. I love to hear that because I know sometimes in activist circles, you know, people sort of say, oh, you know, people are doing it for the health, you know, and that's not good. But I find a lot of people like, you know, yourself, you, you come into it from that perspective and then you find out all these other things and make that shift. So I'm glad that you shared that. Thank you. Um, so you have a, a background, I believe, working in a uh, nonprofit organization. So what, what um, kind of pushed you to what was the shift to take this new direction? Well, I I do have a background in nonprofits. So um, I worked as um, I've I've directed two nonprofits uh, in the 90s and I did nonprofit consulting after that. Um, And while I was doing that, I actually 
was doing veganism work all along. So my sister and I, my sister is a historian and still is, we were going around in the in the late 80s and early 90s just answering folks questions about how we eat, why we eat this way, and we were doing that wherever we could in the in the DC area. So health fairs and churches, we were um, schlepping around coolers of food to do food demos wherever we could. Everything was for free. So we were doing that in our free time. Um, and we actually started a nonprofit organization with a friend of ours in 88, um, feeding homeless residents uh, in DC. And as part of that, we were, we were providing vegan food. So, you know, this was just our life um, outside of work. And I loved, so the, the museum that I was working in, I was, I was a director of a museum first. So um, I was doing museum administration and I did that for six years and I was in my early 20s. I was working 60 to 80 hour weeks and then, you know, doing veganism in my spare time. And it, there just came a point where I decided that I, I loved both of them, but I wanted to do the veganism more. I, I had more of a pull for that. And so it just kind of organically led into me deciding eventually that I, that I wanted to do veganism as a profession. I had volunteered at um, the Vegetarian Society of, D, of D.C., of uh, Compassion Over Killing, other organizations. I worked as a public policy liaison for PCRM, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, and then decided to go to grad school and, and uh, at NYU and get my master's degree in public health nutrition. Um, and so that's kind of how it led into veganism becoming a profession for me. And I always say that my father had visions of me becoming the youngest director of MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, um, <laughs> and I just, <laughs> just kind of had more of a pull towards doing veganism as a, as a profession. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Explain. I think that's a really uh, inspiring example of, you know, just because you start out in one particular area, you're not stuck with that and that you can, you know, completely do a big change around and obviously put, put the, the work in to do that and the studies, et cetera. So I think that's a really, really great and inspirational example of, of someone doing that. That's fantastic. So when you first started out in this new business, um, you know, and you're, you're teaching, you're consulting uh, the public nutrition. So what were some of your key challenges when you first started out? In this new direction? Well, um, it's a good question. And I, for me, one of the biggest personal challenges was understanding how to help people. Um, so how best to meet people where they are and how to share my expertise and my experience, my resources, my passion, my desire for them to go vegan. Um, how best to share that. And um, it took some years for me to figure that out because if people decided that they didn't want to go vegan, it, it affected me personally. It was, um, you know, so, so I had to figure out how to do this work passionately and work with people one-on-one -on -one and in groups and then to let it go. And basically that was, it. Uh, that was a, that was a process. It was a maturing process, an evolution process, um, understanding that some people would go vegan, some wouldn't, some would go back and forth and the whole range of that and being OK with it and understanding that what I'm doing is offering people my my best experience, my expertise, my resources and, you know, and and helping to offer them choices so that they can make the decision. And that was a big, big lesson for me um, that has really helped me uh, during these past, you know, 30 years. Wonderful, wonderful. Oh, that's great. What about then as you've, as um, the challenges, how, what are the, how have they changed over the years? So you've grown your business, your, your profile is raised, you're very well known in this area. How have those challenges of running your service-based business changed um, over the years? Well, um, I've, I've actually had a lot of options in terms of veganism as a profession. So I would say that I've, I've had more opportunities um, to kind of dip my toe into different things. So I've, I've taught people one-on-one. -on -one. 
Um, I've been an associate professor at a university, a local university. I've worked on federal nutrition policy. I've done uh, creative programs. I've taught cooking classes. I've written a book. You know, I've, I've, I speak. So I've done a whole range of things. And so I think that I, I see my, you know, and looking back, I see it as having really a lot of opportunities to kind of explore my different passions for veganism and see which ones I liked the most. So I'm really grateful for that, that I've been able to do that. So that there have been more, really more opportunities than challenges over the years. Okay, no, that's a fair point. And I think that's probably a good example as well about being open to those opportunities and being flexible with your business model, um, which you've obviously done, because then it can, t you know, like you say, decide which which is more of a fit, which do you prefer doing and that, that kind of thing. So that that's a, a great example. Um, so your business and your brand, it's kind of, it's pretty much you and, and, and around you. And obviously, there's only one of you. Um, so, <laughs> and obviously, that can be a bit challenging. Unfortunately, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe when cloning comes, there's a positive to cloning. We can clone more vegans. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so in terms of uh, time, then I noticed on when I was looking at your website, you work um, one to one. You have several one to one um, nutritional counselling um, packages, um, and I know you do organisational counselling. So I'm curious about um, why you favour that way of working, because I know some people are in the marketing field. They say, oh no, you know, just do a whole load of online programs, and you can reach more people, and don't do all the one to one stuff because of time. So I'm curious. Tell me a little bit about why you, you, you like working this way. Well, I actually, um, I actually have done online programs as well. And um, so that's a model that, I've, that I have done. Um, I, you know, obviously have done one-on-one -on -one and still do one-on-one -on -one, um, and organizational consulting. So I actually like all of these ways of working and I'm, uh, I'm fortunate that I'm able to be a little more selective now after 25 years about um, which of the which ones I do at whatever given time. And one of the reasons that I'm able to do that is because I've always had multiple streams of income. So in addition to my income as a vegan professional, I've also, you know, in doing all of these types of work in the vegan field, I've also been a professional editor and writer for 25 years. And I think you do that work as well. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so um, I've always done that. Even when I was a museum professional, I've, I've just, I love, love, love editing and writing. And so I've always done that in some capacity um, for the last 25 years. And I've owned rental property. So Having these other streams of income has kind of taken the pressure off of me so that I can do this work more joyfully how I want to do it. And um, so I've been able to kind of enjoy the work more. So when, you know, and when I do one on one nutrition counseling these days, um, it's with people who want to go 100 percent vegan. They've already made that decision. Um, and they spe they have specific needs, and so I'm I'm able to decide who I want to work with. And when I do organization organizational consulting, you know the same way I, I vet organizations, um, and I have to know what the project is going to be, why they want to collaborate. Um, I have to feel that they have a, a high sense of integrity. Um, so, you know, just over the years, I've been able to because I've been doing this work for so long, I've, I've, I've arrived at a place where I'm able to be a little more selective. And part of that is because I've always um, had other ways of making money. Fantastic. I'm glad you raised that. Actually. I think that's a really important thing for people to consider so that they're not working from that place or running their business from a place of desperation. Right. Um, and whether it's, you know, keeping there, a lot of the people I interview, some say, you know, look, hang on to your full time job or at least go part time so that you've, you've got that regular income coming in while you're starting your business until you get to a place such as yourself where, you, as you say, you can be selective. So I'm, I'm glad you raised that. I think that's an important one for, for people to hear. Um, so in terms of running that you know uh, running a business there's lots of admin and lots of different you know um, other aspects to running a business other than just doing the the actual um, work so how do you handle the many tasks involved in running a business so do you have any expert help or staff or anything like that absolutely 
I have contracted <laughs> with professionals, with with uh, with experts, all throughout um, all throughout these years because um, I'm only one person. I actually have a friend who I feel is like three people, and um, even she contracts. <laughs> and I saw that early on. She was a she was a miracle worker in terms of all that she could get done. But you know, there just comes a point where you have to you have to have help and you have to let that go, and um, trust. That the folks that you bring on are experts in their own areas and that they you know know what they're doing so you know learning that lesson early on as soon as i was able to afford to to bring people on you know on a consistent basis um even as independent contractors i've done that so i've had uh, uh admin um help I've had uh, social media help, I've had marketing and publicity help, I've had interns and volunteers for specific projects. Um, so that's worked really well. And I think the biggest um, example of that would be when my book came out in 2010 and I hired Vegan Mainstream, um, which I know a lot of uh, your listeners are familiar with. It's a fabulous vegan marketing company. Um, yes, yes, Stephanie, who's amazing. Yes, yes. Yes. Owned by Stephanie Red Cross. She's fantastic. And um, she helped me develop a marketing campaign and to grow my, my social media presence and my subscribers list for the launch of my book in 2010. And so we worked together for six months and that was a fantastic experience. Not only did she do all of that, you know, and go beyond um, my expectations, but she also taught me how to do it. So, you know, it, it was definitely a win-win. And and then also, I'll add that I um, that I hired um, a public a publicist to help me with the book. And this is outside of the PR and marketing that my publishing company was doing. Um, and so they helped me schedule a book tour and a media blitz for the first six months after the book came out. So that th at that time, that was the most that I used um, all of these experts at one time and spent a lot of money and, and time and effort. And it paid off. So the book was a national bestseller in the first six months. So when folks are able to do it, I, I absolutely recommend taking on folks. Um, and as a, you know, uh, independent contractual basis as soon as possible. Yeah, fantastic. No, it's a really good point. I can so relate to that. I used to do the books initially for my partner and my business, and I, I do words, not numbers, and I absolutely hated it. And I kind of did it for a while, and then eventually, you know, we gave it to a bookkeeper, and it's like, oh, why didn't we do that sooner? Because, you know, it just makes so much sense. You know, they, it takes up so much time and frees you to do the things that you're good at and that you, you love doing. So I think that's, uh, that's great that you've had those experiences. Wonderful. So let's talk a little bit about competition, and I put it in in quote marks there's now obviously a lot more vegan um, culinary vegan health experts now than ever there's countless YouTube channels and videos and, and all this kind of stuff um, how do you go about standing out or continuing to stand out both we you know within the vegan uh, business arena and, and outside of it and maintaining a steady flow of work well first I think it's great that there are um, all of these um, folks who are who are doing this work, all of these experts, all of these um, bloggers, YouTubers, it's fantastic. That's what we want. Um, so I, I think that's a wonderful thing. And, you know, just in terms of competition, um, the way I look at it is, you know, just, just to be very real about it, um, if I decided to retire today from veganism, from doing all of this work after 25 years, my legacy is sealed, right? Um, so I've been a trailblazer. I've been a first in, in a lot of different areas. I've been a teacher, a mentor, um, an activist, and I've uh, been vegan and healthy for 30 years. I've been teaching for 25 years. I'm still going strong. So I actually can say this freely and proudly because I think I've earned it. And so um, I don't, you know, I put in the work and the time after all of these decades, and there are only a handful of my friends and colleagues who 
have been in this 25, 30 year or more circle doing this work, being vegan teachers with me. So we don't have a lot of competition and that's just being honest, that's just a fact. Um, most people have been in the game for five, maybe 10 years or less. Um, so again, that's great because it shows that the veganism is growing uh, in popularity, which is what we've been working for for the last three decades. So it's a good thing, but in, just in terms of, of me personally, I don't, um, I don't see, uh, I don't see competition as an issue um, because, you know, again, there are not a lot of people who have this this uh, amount of experience. Um, and for those of us who do, we were doing this pre-internet. We were we were naturally collaborating, right? This, there was just an air of collaboration. We saw, you know, we were on the same circuits, and we were trying to grow this movement. And so that that extends even today, you know, 25, 30 years later, we just naturally collaborate. Um, so that's my honest answer to your question. And no, I, I love yeah. that. I love that. <laughs> I think that's really good as well for I think for for uh, you know more mature people to hear that because you know sometimes with the YouTube is it's a lot of the young ones are on there and it seems like you know you've got to be young and cool and funky to kind of do all of this and yet I think it's really good to know that you know your life experience and your work experience and all that history is actually a plus and a bonus. Um, you know, particularly for for you know say older people maybe looking to to start their own businesses you know you can do this whenever and your life experience your work experience is actually a bonus rather than uh, a hindrance so I actually love that you've, you've brought that up which is was wonderful and you certainly are a, a trailblazer and I love the collaboration aspect as well which I'm finding with a lot of vegan business owners and entrepreneurs because we're on this shared vision there is that sense of of collaboration and even just coming on a show like this and you know sharing your expertise shows that that collaboration so that's that's wonderful um, now so in terms of um, marketing and PR so uh, you've very much zoned in on a particular market, the black community and especially um, black women. Um, so I'd love you to talk a little bit about the the importance of picking and knowing your niche rather than doing this kind of spray and pray approach and trying to appeal to everyone. Right. Well, we I think we all have a niche um, or actually multiple niches that we're naturally a part of, of course. And um, so we, you know, we should applaud that and and start there and there's nothing wrong with that because we are already in a niche um so for me one of those is black women and of course i love that just naturally and and also because um black women are the most well-read demographic in the country we we read the most books of anyone in the u.s we're the most college educated we're the fastest growing group of entrepreneurs in the u.s among many other wonderful things. So this, for me, is my natural niche uh, niche or niche, and it's a fabulous one to be in. So I love it. And um, I, you know, I, I welcome it. And, you know, again, I think that we need to kind of see it organically that we all have these niches that we're a part of and we should celebrate them and focus on them and love them and know who who the folks are that we are trying to reach, and there's nothing wrong with that. You cannot appeal to everyone, and you shouldn't want to. Absolutely. No, that's great. Thank you. What about the use of the word vegan? I notice you're not at all shy about using the word vegan, you know, rather than plant-based in your marketing materials. Um, and everyone has different responses to this question. So tell us a bit about your choice of the using the word vegan or how much you use it in your marketing and branding. Right. This is a very recent conversation, I think, about whether to use vegan or plant-based. Um, and that's because there is a money grab going on um, when it comes to, you know, and I'm, I'm just being very blunt about it, when it comes to this market, there's a lot of money to be made now, especially when it comes to processed food. Um, and so, you know, making these distinctions and, and creating these marketing terms um, is is really uh, about that. Um, so you, so whether the person who or the company that's creating the product is vegan or not um, doesn't really matter as much these days. You know, they're just they're focused on marketing and making and making money. And and these processed foods and bridge foods are important, but they are that, and they're not necessary. We don't actually have to have lab grown, lab produced food to be 
<laughs> I it. And so, I, you know, I just say that as a preface to say, you know, I think that this is where a lot of this is being generated, right? Now, yep. that said, um, in the 80s and 90s, when I started out in veganism, we used vegetarian as an umbrella term for all the different types of folks who ate this way. So for vegetarians and vegans and raw foodists, fruitarians, lacto-ovo vegetarians, lacto-vegetarians, vegetarian was the umbrella term. And then we moved to vegan. Um, and so that, you know, and now we're having this conversation about plant-based, which is primarily driven um, by, by the market, um, by, trying, by making money in this market. And so, um, I have been using vegan for all of these decades. I have nothing, I, I see nothing wrong with it. I'm not afraid of it. And because I'm, I, I am more than a plant-based eater, I also have the ideology of veganism. So everything about my lifestyle is vegan. It's, it matters to me um, that I use the word that, ex, that you know, encompasses all of that. So for me, veganism is fine. Um, that term vegan is fine. Um, now, just as a writer, someone who is a writer at heart, I like adjectives. So I use vegan. I use plant based. I use plant strong. I use plant only. I use plant powered. So, uh, you know, in that sense, I like more terms to use than just the word vegan in my writing, just just to um, be more creative and descriptive. So that's my response. Fantastic. I love that. And I love that. And I love that you've been using it all this time as well, which I think is quite cool, because I know a couple of people I've interviewed, they've been around or doing this for quite some time, and they were kind of a bit afraid to use the word, they use the word vegan, but now it's kind of become more kind of trendy and popular, but they've started to use it, but they're using it in a similar way to you, like, you know, to express their ideology. So I love that that's, that's happening now, which is great. Now, you mentioned earlier your book. Um, so you're the author of By Any Greens Necessary, a revolutionary guide for black women who want to eat great, get healthy, lose weight and look fat. Now, PH18. Now, before I ask you the next question, I just want to acknowledge what a fabulous title that is, because it tells people exactly what this book is about. And like we mentioned earlier about the niche or the niche, exactly who the book is aimed at. So I think, first of all, kudos to you for a fabulous title. Um, Thank you very much. (laughs) (laughs) And in terms of having a book, I mean, it's obviously a fantastic way to position yourself as an expert and build credibility as well as raise the profile of your brand. And as you mentioned, it became a national bestseller within the first six months, which is awesome. So can you tell us a little bit about how the book actually came about? So did you pitch the idea to the publisher? Did they approach you? How did it all come about? Um, I actually pitched the idea to a publisher through, you know, a literary agent. Um, Writing is my first love. And so I always knew that I was going to write books. Um, I have many more that I want to write, some about veganism, some not. Um, So it it was just the time for me to write the book. Um, And uh, so I pitched it to a a literary agent. She loved it. And we found um, we actually had a a small bidding war, uh, uh, maybe a small a, a small battle. And Random House was one of those. And we ended up going with Chicago Review Press because Random House had, I think they said five or other six, five or six other books coming out that year. Now, this is in 2009, right? The book came out in 2010. So, of course, now there are hundreds of vegan books that come out um, every year. But at that time, you know, it was just a whole different landscape. So we ended up going with Chicago Review Press, which which is a mid-sized publisher, and um, it was a great great experience. Um, they put they went above and beyond to help promote the book. And the reason that I wrote the book is because um, there's a there's a quote um, from Toni Morrison, and basically it says that um, if the book you want to read hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. I love that. I can so relate to that. (laughs) Right. Well, absolutely. And so this is the book that I wanted, that I would have wanted to read when I first became vegan, um, when I was introduced to it. So I wrote that book and it was a dream come true to write that book. And then um, uh, I'll just add that my sister, 
my sister and I had started um, BlackVegetarians.com in the 90s, and it was the first website by and for African Americans. I think the, the first version of it was in 90, 97. And um, we, um, and it was actually one of the first vegan websites, period. And so we had thousands of subscribers. And so we knew that there was a hungry audience for this kind of information based on that. So I knew that there was a vegan audience for my book. I mean, we had already created a platform for ourselves based on that early, that website and the early work that we were doing. So wow, that's how that's that came right. about. That's fantastic. And just curious, you you chose to go like pitch the the book and and go with a traditional publisher. Um, tell us why you chose it. Because some people, you know, think yeah they want to do that. They want to go the traditional route, and some people want to self publish. And obviously, there's pros and cons, or you know, disadvantages and advantages to both. So, just curious, why you why did you choose that particular route, Tracy? I actually did research at the time into self publishing, and I had a friend who. Um, had done a lot, a lot of work and research and was actually, you know, teaching class, teaching courses about um, self-publishing. And at the time, it's, there were, it was, a, it took a lot more money to self-publish um, than it does today. And so I decided that I actually wanted someone to pay me to write the book rather than pay myself to write the book. Um, and, and basically, that's why I chose to go the traditional route. And today, you know, the, the process has really changed. And so were I starting out today, I would really consider doing self-publishing um, because you're able to produce a very high quality book. And, um, you know, of course, you, you make more money from each book yourself. So, you know, the landscape is just different now, but, I, yeah. you know, I'm in, I'm in the system now. Got it. Fantastic. Fantastic. Now, you recently um, released the first of its kind free African-American vegan starter guide, uh, which is amazing. And that features advice from other black vegan experts and recipes from black vegan chefs. Uh, and you did this, I believe, in partnership with Farm Sanctuary. So tell us a little bit, why did you decide to do this project and what business benefits does it bring you? Well, I, um, my vegan, my colleagues and I, you know, in the vegan world, we have been talking about the need for a guide that was specifically from African American perspectives, and and it did not exist. Um, and so we've been talking about it for years, for decades, really, that it needed to be done. And you know, we we just you know kind of had that in the back of our minds that it needed to exist. And so, you know, but we went about doing our own vegan, our own vegan work in the world. And um, uh, last year, Farm Sanctuary approached me um, to partner on some vegan projects. They wanted to expand their reach to communities of color. So they um, contacted me about, you know, some projects that I was already working on or, or was thinking about doing and, and for possible collaborations. And so this is one of the projects that I talked to them about and they were very excited about it and we decided to partner to produce it. And so that's really how it came about. It's another one of those, you know, Toni Morrison quote things that needed to exist. And so I wanted to write it. I wanted to put to, to bring it into existence. Fantastic. Fantastic. In terms of then, so was this more of a kind of a passion project or has it helped to, uh, you know, to sort of boost your business in any way? Right. The second part of your question. Well, <laughs> it was definitely both. I mean, it was, um, you know, obviously a passion project. Um, you know, because it's something that that I've been thinking about and have been talking about with folks for years. So it was really fulfilling to have finally done that and, and to have it exist. And, you know, I and that would that would have been enough for me. And, you know, just to have this free, comprehensive resource out there in the world. Um, and but I actually ha have been, you know, really surprise, pleasantly so, about the reception. Now, you know, I, I knew that there was an audience for it. Again, you know, just based on my experience, my experiences over these over these decades, I just, I knew that people would, would want it to exist and would be grateful that it exists. Um, but just in terms of the level 
I will give you an example. In the first couple of weeks, I think the first two weeks, we had 10,000 people check out the download. Wow. Um, yeah, it's a lot. And, um, you know, which is which is amazing. That's exactly what we wanted. We've been we've had a we've been on NBC News, um, you know, when they did World Vegan Day, um, they contacted me to do an article and to feature the God. We've been in veg news on their website two or three times. We're going to be in their print magazine in a couple of months. Um, we've been on on websites, podcasts like yours. So the reception has been tremendous. Um, Jane Velez Mitchell of Jane Unchained did a wonderful, she took it upon herself to create a wonderful video about it. Um, and so it's, the reception has been wonderful. The comments have been great. So, you know, it's just expanded my platform. It's expanded my reach, which is, which is wonderful. Fantastic. I think it's a lovely example of how uh, businesses can collaborate with nonprofits uh, to really get a, a win-win for everybody. So I think that that's great that that's happened. And yeah, uh, I've noticed it's really raised your profile, like you say, expanded your platform, which is, is fantastic. Now, you touched on um, media, and I know you mentioned you hired a publicist, particularly when, when you first published your book and you've been featured in media. So I guess nowadays, uh, I'm presuming that media, like you mentioned, NBC, they contact you because you've raised your platform. Like, do you do any kind of active PR nowadays or do you, is it more of a case of journalists come to you now? Um, I, journalists come to me now and, and um, it's really, it started when my sister and I did the website in 1997. I mean, we were immediately um, contacted by the Washington Post and, um, uh, you know, we've been in the Washington Post several times. And, you know, that was our hometown paper and also, you know, the national paper of note. So um, there were not a lot of folks, uh, African-Americans doing that at the time. And so our profile, our platform started then. We were in um, most of the national black publications several times over. Um, over the years. And so, you know, we had we created that platform ourselves. And then, you know, of course, pri primarily white organizations, um, we we had already we were already known just from our work and the community and um, and, uh, you know, going around and speaking and things like that. And so um, they through word of mouth from those organizations, we were we were contacted by uh, Vegetarian Times, Veg News, several times over. So over the years, we've had this platform that's been created and it's kind of ebbed and flowed because we've been doing other things and, you know, we stopped doing the website after a while. We kind of got burned out. So, you know, the platform was already there for us to kind of step into uh, whenever, you know, we were ready to do that again. So, you know, all of the work that I've done has built on that originally. And so, yeah, and so nowadays, um, you know, I probably should do more uh, PR between big projects. Um, and um, but, yeah, you know, most of the time the, the media outlets come to me, which I'm grateful That's for. Fantastic. And obviously, I guess, b being featured in the media, it's a, a great way to to let more and more people know about your your business and your brand, whether that's niche media such as Veg News or Vegetarian Times, and then the broader mainstream um, media such as MB and, uh, NBC. So it's, uh, that's fantastic. So just kind of wrapping up a little bit now, we're going on to a little bit of advice for those who want to run their own business, and particularly, you know, something like yourself, where it's, you know, predominantly you, a sort of service-based business. What in your opinion are the key things they need to take into account before making the jump from employment to running their own business? Well, again, have multiple streams of income in place. Um, that's, to me, um, very important if you're able to do that, as any business owner will tell you the first couple of years can be quite lean. And so if you're able to um, if you're able to have other means of income to support your business so that it continues to be joyful and a passion and, and not as stressful as it otherwise is, um, it helps. So if you're able to, to already have multiple streams of income or to put them in place while you're launching, um, I highly recommend that. Um, and then the other thing I think 
is to, one of the key things is to have um, self-confidence. And um, that, that can require um, you having a community, having a tribe, having a mentor, having whatever kind of support you need to have in place because your self-confidence will be like a roller coaster um, because this is something that is new and different and requires a lot of resolve, a lot from you that you may not have had to, um, to you know, explore about yourself or to have revealed about yourself working for someone else. So have a, tri have a tribe and a community so that you can um, have a steady kind of level of self-confidence and, and self-knowledge and, and know that you have self-worth and you deserve to have happiness and to have a business that you love. Oh, I love that you've you've mentioned that because not too many people mention that actually, and that's really important. You know, I love that you mentioned the practical side of things um, about you know having the alternative streams of income in place. But I think that's really important that you've mentioned that sense of of confidence and and yeah, being able to put yourself out there. And that leads nicely onto our final section, which is actually around mindset. So um, I know you've touched on the the confidence aspect, and I'm I'm curious as well. Are there any other personal qualities you feel are essential to staying the course and running a successful business over time yes I um, I definitely think having cultivating yourself um, having having um, always being ready to be to to be open to learn to keep yourself educated about your profession and just to be in tune with yourself to know if this is still what you want to do. It's okay to pivot. It's okay to stop. It's okay to start again. But really, you have to be in tune with yourself. And things that um, help me to do that personally are meditation and yoga and exercise, um, taking vacations, um, just really cultivating myself. Because, um, you know, for the type of business I have, um, you know, as you said, it's, it's me, I'm the brand. And if I'm not passionate about it, I need to stop. I need to step away. I need to evaluate. And, and I am OK with that. Um, and so, you know, know, know yourself, stay in tune with yourself. And I think meditation and yoga and exercise are really essential to help you do that. Yeah, yeah, that's a great reminder, actually, about the, the sense of well-being, because uh, sometimes we can get a bit carried away running our own businesses and then kind of running ourselves into the ground. So that, that self-care is is very important. I'm glad you've reminded me of that. I'll have to actually go to the gym later today. So <laughs> I'm glad you've been, that's a nice little, that was the universe telling me through you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, so, all right. Well, so final question then, um, Tracy. You're doing some amazing stuff. You, as you say, you've been a trailblazer and a, a pioneer. And I'm, I'm so glad you, you've shared your experiences and expertise. What's your long-term vision, or for yourself and your brand? I know you touched on. You've got some other books you're looking to write. Anything else you, you'd like to share with us about uh, anything else you've got coming up? Um, well, I um, I actually do have my my next book. I just signed a book deal with DeCapo. Um, oh, congratulations. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very Yay. much. Um, thank you. <laughs> I'm very excited. It's called Ageless Vegan and um, it's going to oh, actually, it's actually, what a title. Another fabulous title. Do you come up with these? Because that, that's another really cool title. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I did. Um, and actually, uh, it, uh, one of the reasons I came up with it is because it, the book is going to feature me and my mother. So oh, lovely. I've been vegan. We've both been vegan for 30 years. So I've been vegan from, from age 20 to 50. And my mother has been vegan from age 50 to 80 and counting. Oh, that's wonderful. So collectively from ages 20 to 80, right? And so we've got a lot of experiences to share. Um, just being able to do this, you know, in a, in a healthy and, and, and successful way and to share it with others. So um, that book is coming up. So I'm, so we're going to be working on that together for the next several months. And um, I'm also in talks about um, launching a vegan product line right now. So when I have more information to share about that, hopefully I can come back uh, and talk to you about it. 
Yeah, like definitely keep us up to date with the book and, and that because, yeah, we definitely want to, to know about that. That's exciting. Wow. Oh, that's really good to hear. And I'm really interested in the book. That sounds wonderful. I'll definitely uh, look forward to, to reading that. So uh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Tracy. It's been fantastic speaking with someone who's been, you know, such a pioneer over such a, a long period of time. So I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your wisdom and your insights and your expertise with our listeners. Thank Thank you so much. Thank you, Katrina. And I love your show. I listen to it all the time. And thank you for the work that you're doing as well. So that was Tracy McQuirter, public health nutritionist, best-selling author and plant-based educator. You can find out more at byanygreensnecessary.com. And that link is on the show notes page at veganbusinessmedia.com forward slash podcasts and going to episode 54. Now for our Vegan Business News Roundup. You may remember a couple of episodes ago, I reported that London, UK was set to get its first all-vegan fried chicken shop, the Temple of Satan. Well, it opened last weekend and the response was brilliant. The Evening Standard reports that queues for the eatery, which is located on Morning Lane in Hackney in the city's east end, next to a butcher shop, (laughs) snaked around the block, despite the cold weather and rain. Even though they had to wait in line for some time, customers were bowled over by the food, taking to social media to rave about it, as well as the excellent customer service. The venue thanked people on its Facebook page, saying the opening day had been unbelievable. So it just goes to show when you have a unique product that people want, they'll go out of their way to access it. And the business did the right thing by training their staff well and keeping customers happy. Very pleased to hear the opening of this new eatery was a success. Still on the subject of London, my original hometown keeps trying to tempt me back. (laughs) It's now got an all-vegan Mexican eatery, also in Hackney. Club Mexicana, a popular vegan street food cart, has found a permanent home in Haggerston, taking up residency at Restaurant Pamela on Kingsland Road, reports the Evening Standard. Founder Marielle Armitage, who left her job in advertising to start Club Mexicana, told the newspaper, Our food is all about flavour, which packs a punch, but with a sprinkling of 80s kitsch to sweeten the blow. The menu includes barbecue pulled jackfruit taco, traditional nachos with black beans, cheese sauce and sour cream, and a crispy jackfruit tinga pancake. Pamela, named as a tribute to celebrities by that name, including Pamela Anderson and Pam Greer, previously hosted a meat and fish based street food business. So this is a fantastic move to take on a 100% plant based menu. Well, I'm definitely going here when I visit London in October because I love Mexican food. I've predicted, as you know from previous episodes of Vegan Business Talk, that we'll see more and more niche vegan eateries and it's great to see this happening. You know when plant-based proteins beat animal-based meat in awards that things are starting to change for the better. Vegan Chorizo has taken out the top gong in Trader Joe's annual Customer Choice Awards and the runner-up was Meatless Meatballs, reports latest vegan news. Customers had the choice of voting for any meats sold in the chain stores across the US. Consumers had their say, with animal products coming in third, fourth and fifth places. This is fantastic news. Another step towards vegan world domination. Bring it on. (laughs) Event cinemas in Australia experienced a social media backlash this week after it refused to honour the terms and conditions of its ice cream topping competition. The My Chop Top competition invited participants to create their own topping. The top three most popular ones would be sold at participating cinemas in late February and the winner who sold the most would receive a year's supply of the product. Shortly after the competition opened, vegan entries took the lead. Cassandra Tui's classic vegan choc top hit the number one spot with nearly 3,000 votes, while 10 other vegan entries were also in the running. 
Then, even though there were no restrictions on dairy-free alternatives, the cinema chain emailed the vegan entrants to tell them the word vegan was being removed from their entries. Unsurprisingly, competition entrants, their supporters and the vegan community were not happy and lambasted event cinemas on its social media platforms. Many wanted to withdraw their votes and were furious that those votes would now go to a cruelty-laden product. The company gave no reason why they couldn't or wouldn't make vegan ice cream, despite vegan ice cream companies offering to help out. As I told Veg News Online, which ran the story, this was a major PR fail on Event Cinema's part. It shows how out of touch the company is with consumer demand for vegan products. They had an opportunity to position themselves as innovative and progressive, and they missed it. Now, on the plus side, because I do like to report positive news on this podcast, several vegan ice cream brands got some good publicity on social media as people cited them as dairy-free alternatives, and some of the companies stepped forward to offer collaboration with the cinema chain. Finally, a Dutch company has launched a vegan bacon product made from seaweed, reports Food Navigator. Seymour's IC Bacon, and that's spelt S-E-A, is made using organic, unprocessed dulse sourced from aquatic farms in Ireland and France. The company's promotional video for the product highlighted the environmental impact and animal welfare issues involved in raising pigs for food and positioned its vegan alternative as a solution for people to enjoy the flavour of bacon without the cruelty and the unsustainability. Seymour launched in 2014 with a seaweed pasta made from a species of seaweed called Himanthala clongate. That's a bit of a mouthful. (laughs) The two products are currently available to buy in eight countries, as well as Seymour's online store, which ships worldwide. Founder Wilhelm Soderland said future plans for the company include wraps and ready-made meals. How fabulous is this? I love these new food categories that are springing up with products that are good for people, animals and planet. So that's it for this episode of Vegan Business Talk. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed the show, I'd really appreciate it if you gave it a review and rating on iTunes or any other platform you're listening on. Finally, I encourage you to head over to veganbusinessmedia.com where you can find more resources, including details of my media and PR consultations, copywriting, editing and proofreading services to help you grow your vegan business. I'm Katrina Fox, author of Vegan Ventures, Start and Grow an Ethical Business, and I look forward to catching up with you in the next episode of Vegan Business Talk. Bye for now. Yeah.